Second Timothy for beginners, lesson number five, warnings and assurances for the future. And we are in chapter three. And we're going to try to cover uh, verses one to 17 this morning as we uh, get to the end of this uh, epistle. Little review for, uh, for us. So uh, the Apostle Paul has spent the first half of his letter to Timothy, both encouraging and instructing his spiritual son in the Lord and his disciple in ministry. So he's done several things. First, he's tried to encourage him to be faithful in the Lord, to seek after a righteous life and conduct, not to be discouraged in his work, and to, of course, follow Paul's example of a courageous, hopeful attitude when facing hardship because of his faith in ministry. Uh, also, as far as instruction is concerned, his instructions to Timothy mainly deal with his resp Timothy's response to those in the church who were causing confusion and loss of faith because of their teaching about the resurrection. These teachers were promoting the idea that there was no bodily resurrection, only a, a, a kind of a spiritual or symbolic renewal when a person became a Christian at baptism. Their point was, well, you know, you know, sure, sure, there's a resurrection, but it's that resurrection. You come out of the water, you're a new person. That, that's, what, that's the only resurrection you have. You know, there is no bodily resurrection. That's what they were, they were promoting that idea. This caused, obviously, discouragement and a loss of faith for many in the church. Because if that was true, well, it was the same as any other religion then. You know, how is Christianity any better than any other religion? You, know, you adhere to the rules and you go through the ceremonies and then you die and that's it. What, you know, what's the point? The whole point of Christianity is resurrection from the dead. We have a risen Savior. I mean, if you take that out of, you know, out of the Christian religion, well, it's not worth it. So Paul's instructions, therefore, are focused on how Timothy is to respond to this teaching and those who are teaching as well as those uh, negatively affected by it. How, do we, how does he deal with the guys who are teaching this stuff and how does he deal with the people who are kind of becoming discouraged because of it? To this end, Paul instructs this young preacher to hold fast to what he has been taught. Don't you be swayed. Also to avoid useless debates and simply preach the word of God. He tells him to take care to accurately preach and teach only what he has received in order to establish and maintain his own credibility. Don't be teaching stuff, you know, don't go beyond what you have been taught. Stick to what you have been taught. And preach and teach those caught up in this heresy with an attitude of kindness and gentleness and patience so that the truth of the word will not be undermined by an unchristian character and attitude. You know, sometimes we, we have the right doctrine and the right argument, but the wrong attitude. Uh, so sometimes we can discourage a, a sincere seeker who just doesn't understand. We, we tell them the correct things, but sometimes our attitude is such that it, you know, it's not loving, it's not kind. And so Paul, and that's nothing new. I know people have knocked us you know, in the Church of Christ, have kind of criticized the church for having that attitude at times, but it's nothing new. It's not like we invented that. I mean, this is the problem back in the first century. So Paul follows this teaching and encouragement part of his letter uh, with a warning. The thrust of Paul's letter has been limited to Timothy's personal attitude and what has been going on at the congregation where he serves. Paul will now provide a warning concerning society and the church in general and the times that they live in and, um, and what is to come in the future. So we go to chapter three, verse one. He says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. 
So we need to clarify what time period Paul is talking about when he uses the term last days because we hear so many uh, teachings uh, where the principal idea is the last days. Okay? The Bible um, in the Old Testament tells us that the Messiah was coming in the future, but no one knew exactly when that would uh, take place. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7, 14 and 9 verse 6, Micah chapter 5 verse 7, you know, the, the prophets were telling of the Messiah to come in the future. They spoke of Jesus or the Messiah's first coming. And while here, Jesus taught that after His death and resurrection and ascension, He would return a second time. Okay, let's read one passage, get out of 2 Timothy, go to John chapter 14. Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, and here's the point right here, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so Jesus here talks about a return, a second time that He would, that he would come. Jesus also emphasized the fact that the time of His return, His second appearance, was not revealed to man. So we go to Mark chapter 13. He says, but of that day or hour, speaking of His return, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. And so the Holy Spirit, through the apostles, provided more detail about what would take place when Jesus returned, but not the exact time. Now we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul writes, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. The ones who have no hope, they have no hope of resurrection, is what they're talking about here. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, that's His second coming, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. The problem in Thessalonica was that some were teaching that, oh, the resurrection has already happened. You, know, it's, uh, you missed it. <laughs> you missed the boat. And so Paul is reassuring them, don't worry. When Jesus comes, you know, uh, those of you, those who are dead are not going to kind of miss the resurrection, like only the living ones are going to go. Every, everybody's going to go with Jesus. And he, he breaks it down. He says, for the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Ah, okay, there's the order. All those who died in Christ, all the faithful ones who died in Christ, and that includes you know, all the way back to Abraham, Moses, you know, all of those who died believing in the promise, believing in Christ when He came, all of those people, they're going to rise from the dead first, he says. Then we who are alive, meaning there will be people on earth living when Jesus returns. And so the believers who are alive when Jesus returns the second time, and He says, uh, those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. In other words, the dead in Christ, the faithful throughout the centuries, they rise first. And the ones who are alive when He comes, they join them. And where do they join them? In the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord forever. Notice, there's no, well, we do a thousand years here first, and then there's there's none of that. I've told you before, it all happens the twinkling of an eye. The return, the, re the destruction of the earth, the resurrection, the coming together, the being in the air, the judgment of Satan, the judgment of the evil and the disbelievers, bing, bang, boom, it's all done in the twinkling of an eye. And so Paul is giving the kind of the short form here of that in uh, First uh, Thessalonians. 
So Paul, um, or the other writers, mention the last days. So Paul here, he's talking about the last days over here, right? They're talking about a period of time that stretched between Jesus' cross, you know, His death, His burial, His resurrection, His ascension, and Jesus' return at the end of the world to judge. Those are the last days. Therefore, in the first verse, when Paul mentions the last days, He's not referring to that period of time that shortly precedes Jesus' return. You know, a time that modern day prophets spend a whole lot of energy trying to predict. You ever see them? They throw up a, <laughs> they throw up a you know, information board and their lines and arrows and there's like this is happening and that is happening. And, you know, and they're trying to explain the last days, the last little time before Jesus returns and how you're going to be able to know because of the, you know, the north is going to be against the south and there'll be a war. And you know, they write entire books about, he's not talking about the last couple of days, years or century before Jesus returns when he says the last days. When Paul talks about the last days, he's talking about the time that he himself was living in as well as the times that we're living in today and all the time that passes until Jesus suddenly appears a second time, a time that nobody knows. It's so interesting how many times in the, in the Bible it says nobody knows and how many times people today pretend that they know. <laughs> the Lord Himself is saying nobody knows. Even the Son doesn't know, meaning Jesus, the human side of Jesus, not the divine side, the human side, he didn't. Uh, the Father's going to determine that, he says. Okay? So all the time between the cross and Jesus' return, those are the last days. This is what the writers of the New Testament understood. A couple of examples. In Acts 2.17 it says, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Well, when did that happen? Well, it happened in Pentecost. The spirit was given to the apostles, and they began to speak in tongues, and you know, miracles took place, and well, that was 2,000 years ago. And yet the prophet says, in the last days. Well, yeah, that was the beginning of the last days. In Hebrews chapter one, verse two, he says, in these last days, has meaning the Son, he says, has spoken to us, excuse me, God rather, um, in these last days has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. Well, when, when did the Hebrew write, writer write Hebrews? Well, he, he wrote it back in the first century. And what is he saying? In these last days. So he, the writer, understood that he, through inspiration, he was living in the last days. And his argument wasn't so much, these are the last days, his argument was that God has spoken to us now through Jesus. No more through the prophets, no more through you know, the rabbis, no more through the high priest. In these last days, since Jesus has come, in all these last days, God now speaks to us only through Jesus, His Son. Second Peter chapter 3, verse three, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. Again, he understood they were living in the last days. So you can't project ahead and say, oh no, no, in, in the year 2000, or excuse me, in, in the year uh, uh, of the apostles, you know, in the first century, they were referring to some future time, you know, uh, 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 where the return of Jesus was imminent. And my, thing, you know, my point is, what, what brings you to assume that? Certainly not these passages, because these writers were assuming they were living in the last days. So in the passage that we're looking at, Paul is trying to help Timothy see beyond his own situation 
and get a kind of a big picture view of the world and the church and what the future held. Because of sin and many false notions and ideas in the world, things were not going to get better, they would deteriorate. You know, Timothy may have thought, wow, Jesus has come, atonement for sin has been accomplished, miracles have been performed, the apostles you know, are planting churches, and now there's a second generation happening, you know, himself, second generation, young preachers, him, Titus, these guys. You know. He's thinking, all right, there's no way to go but, but up. And Paul is trying to bring him into reality here. Yeah, it's, it's good, and yes, we've accomplished a lot, but you, you, know, <laughs> you need to understand something about the world. The coming of Jesus and His sacrifice, the preaching of the gospel, and the establishment of the church along with the promise of Jesus' return was God's response to a fallen world, not a spiritually viable world. The point he's going to be making to Timothy is, you still live in a fallen world. And I would repeat, we still live, 2,000 years later of Christianity, we still live in a fallen world. I know, you know sometimes we look at the politics, I don't even want to get into that, but we look at the politics and we read about what's going on. It's discouraging. It doesn't matter if you're a, if you're a Democrat or a Republican, it's just discouraging what's going on, all the fighting and this and that. And, and we're thinking, oh wow, you know, could, it, could times be worse? We live in a fallen world. What, what should we expect? So this passage may have been Paul's way of providing a quote reality check to a young preacher's inward focus because of the difficulty. He thinks that the trouble he's having in Ephesus is like the whole world, you know? And Paul is saying, what you're going through is just a, a microcosm of the bigger picture. Paul has coached Timothy in how to preserve his own faith and how to successfully carry out his ministry of preaching and teaching God's word, even in the face of opposition, even in the face of opposition within the church. That's the hardest way to preach. <laughs> but in verses one to nine of chapter three, he opens Timothy's eyes to the true gravity of the situation that all Christians, as well as ministers, face in this lost and dark world. In, in this time period, the last days, right? From Jesus' cross till Jesus' return, the last days, Paul is saying, there will be difficult seasons or periods when wickedness will flourish. That's the main message here of what he's saying. And isn't that the truth? Isn't that what history is like? You know, continual war broken up by periods of peace. Continual war broken up by periods of peace. There are times when it seems we're at peace, things are going well, there's prosperity, you know, even in our own nation, and then it goes south. All of a sudden, you know, there's a war that breaks out, there's a misunderstanding, there's a leader that arises that's dynamic but evil. <laughs> if you think things are going bad today, I don't know if any of us in this room were alive during World War II, or alive as adults, let's put it this way. But you talk to those 90 year olds who may have you know, been very young people during World War II, that's pretty scary stuff. When the entire, it seemed the entire world was at war and they were playing for keeps. If you lost, you were subjugated. It wasn't your country anymore. You know, think about the people who lived in France and Holland and you know, Poland, that, that country, man. Their country wasn't theirs anymore. The Nazis came and then they, they split up their country with the Russians, you know. That's, that's terrible. So uh, Paul is trying to you know, open uh, Timothy's eyes to the idea that the world is a, is a bad place is a dangerous place. 
And so in this time period, the last days, he says, they're going to be difficult seasons when wickedness will flourish. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this to put into context the verses that we're going to read now. In uh, verses uh, two to five, he says, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Not just people in the church here, he's talking about people. So there's a certain order to the evil and sin listed here by Paul. Lovers of self. In other words, they love self rather than God. They're selfish. Lovers of money, greedy, worldly. The gratification of self is a priority. Boastful, bragging about self. Arrogant, overbearing towards others. Revilers, meaning angrily criticizing both God and man. So these first five are the general characteristics of wickedness seen in evil people. He names more specific sins that underline these general attitudes. So these are kind of general attitudes. And so can you imagine if you have uh, leaders in your nation that this is what drives them? That this is part of their character? So now he gets more specific in the next list. Disobedient to parents, meaning early rebellion. The, their rebellious nature was seen early on. Ungrateful, a companion sin to rebellion. It is the first sin that leads to complete wickedness. Romans chapter one, verse 21. And they refused to give thanks. And when he says, and they refuse to give thanks, he then, in Romans, he then describes the downward spiral. But it begins there, he says. Unholy, no respect for what is sacred. Unloving, without natural affection. Irreconcilable, in the Greek, meaning one who will not declare a truce in order to end a war. In other words, a person where you cannot appeal to this person's better nature because he doesn't have one or she doesn't have one. Malicious gossips spread or intentional evil facts or stories about others. Politically, we call it propaganda. uncontrolled, untamed, unrestrained by conscience or love, by conscience or love. Haters of good, without love for what is good in itself or good for another. Treacherous, traitorous, a person who has no loyalty whatsoever. Reckless, headstrong, imprudent, rash, foolish, conceited, puffed up, a know-it-all. I don't know about you, but I've read some histories and some biographies about world leaders, some who are good you know, and others who are evil. And I remember uh, Hitler, for example, and what I've read about him, <laughs> these last couple of ones describe this guy to a T, to a T. Reckless, he was reckless and foolish and egotistical. Decided he was going to wipe out Russia. His, uh, those who study military history know his big mistake was he, he was winning and then he decided, you know what, Russia, our ancient enemy, he decided to turn his attention to Russia. And when he did that, boy, that's it. His troops got caught up there in the winter. Anyway, it's a long story, but that was uh, the fatal mistake. And his fatal mistake, Caused by what? His ego, his treacherousness, because he had, a, he, he had a, an agreement with the Russians. 
while plotting to attack them. No loyalty to the guy, reckless, conceited, thought that you know, no one wouldn't listen to his generals. His generals, you know, the military guys were saying, you know, they, were, they just counted soldiers, tanks, time, you know, not a good idea, let's win where we're, where we're winning. Let's not divert, let's, you know, let's stay the course. He knew better. This guy who never rose above being a corporal, I believe, he knew better than his you know, lifetime military men who were military men. Lovers of pleasure, the love that should go to God is lavished on self. So in verse five, Paul notes that many people who practice these things and have these sinful attitudes cover these with a veneer of religiosity. That's his point there. You know, they deny its power, meaning, oh yes, they give, they give you know, lip service to religion. Oh yes, it's an important thing, and, but they deny its power. They talk the talk and they may even attend church, but aside from their show of religion, they do not demonstrate the power and the results of true spirituality in their lives. Things like good works and a Christ-like character and a pure life and influence for Christ and others. I'm not pointing out anybody in particular, but one president in our nation, one president after another has been you know, photographed you know, coming out of one of the churches in Washington on the Lord's Day with their Bible in their hand and their wife by their side. You know, every, every president has got you know, a picture of that because many people in the United States are believers and churchgoers. You know. But if you study the lives of these men, you, you, might, not, you might not see, you know, really, this guy was a churchgoer? So this attitude is nothing, is nothing new. Verse six and seven, we keep going, he says, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So here Paul gives an example of how some of these religious impostors prey on women, this is the example he gives, women with sensitive consciences who are too weak-willed to abandon their various lusts and embrace the gospel that would free them. They instead latch on to these religious manipulators who calm their consciences for a time with false religious or psychological comfort food in exchange for loyalty, money, or sexual favors. Yes. Even that was going on. Again, we think is, that's a new phenomenon that they, you see these preachers, you know, the well-known ones on TV, whatever, and then you hear about what's happened. They've run off with someone else's wife or whatever. Well, I didn't think that was possible. Well, of course it's possible. And it's been going on since the first century because Paul is talking about that very thing here. Verse eight and nine. He says, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men of depraved mind rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus's and Jambres' folly was also. So Paul compares the actions of the religious impostors that he's just described to the two magicians in Pharaoh's court who opposed Moses' effort to appeal for the release of the Jewish people held in slavery there. If you remember the story when Moses goes before the Pharaohs, these guys here reproduced some of the miraculous signs, actually the first three, that uh, Moses performed, but then they were unable to duplicate the rest. Well, in the same way, that these two magicians, and by the way, it's the only place in the Bible where they are named. They're not named in the Old Testament, but they're named here for some reason. Uh, these two magicians did not prevail against Moses. The religious impostors, therefore, and the general wickedness in society, Paul is saying, will not prevail against the gospel and its ministers and the church. 
So he's saying these magicians back in Moses, like I'm saying to you, some of these things we think are just a, ph a phenomenon that takes place in our generation. And I'm saying to you, look, it, it was happening 2,000 years ago. Well, Paul is saying exactly the same thing to Timothy 2,000 years ago. He's saying, you think powerful evil men you know, uh, 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 are obstructing the work of the, of the gospel and the church? So he, he points them back to Moses and he says, this was going on thousands of years ago. Well, for them, maybe 1,500 or so years ago uh, in, in the court of the Pharaoh, where powerful, wicked men performed, uh, quote, false miracles in opposition to Moses. And so wickedness and evil and powerful evil, he's saying, is nothing new. It was there way back fighting against the truth when Moses was alive. It's happening with you now and it will continue to happen into the future throughout the last days until Jesus returns. But eventually this truth, the gospel, will become as obvious to all just as the failure of the Egyptian magician's opposition eventually became obvious. Eventually Moses did enough miracles that they could not reproduce that demonstrated if they had power, it's no power compared to the power that Moses has. And by implication, he's saying to Timothy, people are fighting against you and people are opposing you, but you stick at it, you keep going and you'll see that the power of the gospel will outlast and overcome the power of evil that is opposing it. In the church, he says, as well as in the, in the world. So with this general comparison, Paul ends the section, uh, you know, the warning section in his letter. Uh, in chapter three, verse 10, he moves on to another phase of his encouragement. He says, now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them, out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceived and deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So in these verses, Paul summarizes not only his life in ministry, but his ministry with Timothy. The takeaways for Timothy reading this passage are, first of all, you've had a good example in me. Keep following it. Don't, don't let the opposition that you are suffering now stop you. It didn't stop me, I'm, I'm, I'm still at it, he says. Even though I'm in jail, I'm still at it. You do the same. Secondly, a reminder that ministry is hard. Ministry is hard and sometimes dangerous. Don't be surprised. Don't be discouraged. You can, you can be hurt and um, you can be disappointed or you can be insulted or you can be a lot of things, but don't be surprised. Don't ever be surprised. Ministry is hard work. It goes well for a time and then it gets hard, it gets difficult. Rely on the Lord, he says. Rely on the Lord in all things and He will both provide and rescue you. One of the problems with preachers that get into trouble is that they've encouraged the congregation to rely on the Lord, but then when it comes for them to do it, they don't do what they have told others to do. Don't be discouraged when you see evil upon evil in the world and it only seems to be getting worse. This is how the world operates. Don't be surprised, this is how the world operates. 
What will we do if evil takes over? Well, we, we, you and I, we know what we'll do. We'll continue doing what we have always done. Worship the Lord, share our faith, maintain our faithfulness. You know, sometimes it's easy to do that. Sometimes it's difficult to do that. But we always know what it is that we are about. We always know what our role is. No, no, there's no confusion in our minds. And stay focused, stay focused to Timothy. He says, stay focused on God's word and remember those who taught you and ultimately brought you to salvation. Despite the evil in the world and the challenge of ministry, Paul encourages Timothy to find hope and direction in God's word, which has led Timothy to salvation, which has led Timothy into ministry, and now, Paul says, which also will provide what he will need in the future. It always comes back to God's word, always. Chapter three, he says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So Paul is always calling Timothy back to the scriptures to provide faith, hope, courage, and perseverance in trial. With these verses, he reminds Timothy why he needs to rely exclusively on scripture to safely navigate the world and effectively lead and teach the church. There's a reason why he needs to always depend on the word. Number one, the word, the Bible, the scriptures, they're inspired. The information and direction comes from God, so, God, so uh, Timothy can use them with confidence. Where does my confidence come to speak? Well, it comes from here. What is my prayer? My own personal, his prayer, but my own personal prayer is always, Lord, please help me be accurate. Help me accurately teach the spirit and the letter of what you have written, period. Another reason to rely on scripture. They were given for a purpose. They're not just some random books that some guy slapped together. There's, there's a reason that God gave us this. And Paul names some of them. They're adequate. They're given for a purpose. They're given for teaching. Teaching what? Teaching God's will. God's will is revealed here. What does he want? They're good for reproof, meaning used to verify the truth or the value of an idea or an action. How valuable is this idea that someone comes up with? Well, compare it to the scripture. You'll find how accurate that idea is by comparing it to the scripture. Does it reflect what the scripture teaches? Then it's valuable indeed. It's good for correction, he says, to maintain the proper course, a course correction on our spiritual journey. You know, it's like a sailing ship, you know, it's like the rudder. This is the rudder that makes sure the wind blows us to the right or to the left. You know? The scripture always helps us to come back to true north. And of course, good for training in righteousness to train and teach how to think and how to act in a righteous or an acceptable manner. To help the believer mature in godly character and godly service. What do we use? We use this. Why do we have Bible study? There are a lot of churches, all they have is a, they have a worship. They have communion, they have worship, they have a 10, 15, what they call a homily a little what we call a devo, and that's it. They're good to go for the rest of the week. Why is it that we have a Bible class where we actually study the scripture itself and then a good 30 to 40 minute less secondary lesson, and then we have more teaching Sunday night, and then more teaching on Wednesday and other opportunity. Why, why do we do that? Well, we do that for this here. We want to grow as Christians. So, <clears throat> Despite the sorry state of the world and the challenges of ministry in the church, Paul is confident that if Timothy stays faithful to God's word in both his conduct and his teaching, he will succeed in maintaining his own salvation and he will bring others to salvation as well. You know, the, 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 um, 
the bottom line and the final result is always, will the minister himself remain faithful and will he help the church to remain faithful as well? I've said it a thousand times, I'll say it again, when the Lord comes, his second return, he's not looking for a big church, he's looking for a faithful church. You know, if you're five people meeting in your living room and you're faithful, he'll take you with him. If you're 5,000 people meeting in a $50 million building, but you're not faithful to his word, yeah, that won't do. Faithfulness is the key. All right, All right that's it. One more class and we're finished Second Timothy, and then we'll move on to Titus, and that'll be the, uh, that'll be the end of the series. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>